I had access literally to the hard drives from the drug companies, from the executives, from the scientists, from the marketing people. And I could do analyses with complete transparency to examine how the drug companies were manipulating research and covering up results and hiding results with the experts they hired to go out and sell their drugs. I would sign a confidentiality agreement first. So unless the data were unsealed by the court, I can't talk about it. Okay, so right now you're speaking on things that you can legally speak on, but there's probably quite a bit that you just can't. Correct. Yeah, it's only a small fraction of what I know that I can speak about. It oh, makes a man. good story. <laughs> It's not the public can't handle it. It's that the media won't allow it out. And there should be independent oversight. And that independent oversight isn't there. So the drug companies can design studies of weight loss drugs or cholesterol lowering drugs or diabetes drugs that are designed to produce results that will sell the most drugs. As a practicing doctor, knowing what you know, if somebody were to come to you and ask you if they should get on one of those fat loss medications because they need to lose weight, would you feel worried for their safety? I would be worried. The secret underneath all of this that's going on, all the problems that we see in healthcare, and they're enormous, the secret is, Pretty much everybody that's involved with the carnivore and the animal-based lifestyle is doing so because they want to lose weight, they want to get off of their medications, they want to stop being sick, they want to feel good, they want to look good. This conversation today, if you are any of those people, is specifically for you. John Abramson I'm having on today was such an interesting conversation. John was an expert in litigation against pharmaceutical companies, and literally he had access to the actual hard drives that the executives at these big pharmaceutical companies were using to hold their data. So he could literally see in these litigations how these companies were potentially manipulating the data to ultimately generate profit from all of us buying their pharmaceutical products. John is also a lecturer at Harvard for healthcare policy, and he was hired by the FBI as a consultant to be in part of the single largest criminal case in United States history with, you guessed it, a pharmaceutical company. They ended up settling for $1.4 billion. So if you've ever wondered why your medications aren't working or why you're still on 17,000 medications or potentially why this animal-based carnivore lifestyle has been working so well, I highly recommend you watch this all the way through. It is insane. And my ask of you is if you get something out of this, if you do like these videos, if you do like this content, please subscribe so that I can continue to build up this base because the bigger the audience base, the bigger the guests are that I can have on and obviously the more truth we can unravel. So without any further ado, let's get into it. For me, I'm thinking about the person that's on multiple medications, the person who's taking a lot of pharmaceuticals to heal their ailments, who might be trying to lose weight. I think the average person in the United States is on 17 medications <laughs> across the board, the average person. So there's families that are trying to heal their kids. There's older people that are trying to get better and not be sick anymore. Why does the work that you're doing matter so much? What is the foundational reason that you believe or you know that these people aren't getting better with their medications? But I think the key issue, <clears throat> as you framed it, you know, why are so many people unhealthy, overweight, not living a, a, a healthy life and getting medical care that they think is good medical care? I think the key issue is that underneath all the problems that we see in healthcare, the uh, high cost of drugs and drug advertising and uh, hospital and insurance problems. Underneath all of that is an information problem, a knowledge problem. The knowledge that doctors have is biased to serve um, uh, the market and specifically to maximize return on investors' uh, financial investments. What doctors believe to be the knowledge that they can trust is not trustworthy. It's manipulated and controlled, and the docs don't understand that. Are you aware of the research for cholesterol that was paid off for the Harvard professors who were studying it and researching it? Or is that something that's kind of come across? Well, your desk? well all the researchers are paid off. <clears throat> all the studies are commercially funded. So this sham continues um, with doctors trained to accept the uh, analyses that are done non-transparently. 
the late 1990s, the journals were going off the rails supporting drug company marketing programs. And um, I got my teeth into the Vioxx issue where there were data that the FDA had submitted to Merck that showed that Vioxx, an arthritis drug that came out in 1999, was significantly more dangerous and no more effective than over-the-counter uh, drugs. I left practice at that point to write a book to explain this problem and how the journals were supporting the drug marketing. Vioxx was pulled the week after my book came out. Um, and I was on the Today Show twice and made maybe 80 national television appearances. But then lawyers started to call me to work in national lit litigation. So in, as, a, as an expert in litigation, I had access literally to the hard drives from the drug companies, from the executives, from the scientists, from the marketing people. And I could do analyses that could, could with complete transparency, to examine how the drug companies were manipulating research and covering up results and hiding results from the people they hired, the experts they hired to go out and sell their drugs. How did you get access to these corporate hard drives? Right. <laughs> That's crazy. So as That's, an expert in yeah. litigation, there's discovery, like the discovery that goes on now in the Trump trials. Um, and the experts have to have access to all the data. I would sign a confidentiality agreement first, so unless the data were unsealed by the court, I can't talk about it. Okay, so right now you're speaking on things that you can legally speak on, but there's probably quite a bit that you Co just can't. Correct. Because yeah, it's only a small fraction of what I know that I can speak about, <clears throat> but it, it oh, makes man. a good story. <laughs> yeah, you sit on a wealth yeah. of information, yeah. my friend. You yeah. sit on a lot. <laughs> yeah, but the public can't, oh, I mean, the, the, it's not the public can't handle it. It's that the media won't allow it out. Yeah, Lauren, the, the core problem is that the vast majority of doctors are doing their best. They are honorable people. They're trying to help their patients the best. They're trying to use their scientific education to provide uh, access to the latest technology for their patients. The secret underneath all of this that's going on, all the problems that we see in healthcare, and they're enormous, the secret is that the information that the doctors rely on and must rely on is now produced and distributed almost entirely by commercial interests, the drug companies and the device companies. And their job, it's not that they're greedy, their job is to maximize the financial return to investors each quarter to increase the financial return to investors. There's no amount of profit that will satisfy investors. They want maximum profits. And what's happening is in the process, the complex process of creating and distributing the knowledge, what's happening is the doctors are getting the wrong, um, what they learn as the best scientific evidence is not only not transparent and not complete and not accurate, but it's about the wrong thing. Because 80% of our health is determined by how we live our lives. And only 20% of our health is determined by the health care we get. That 20% is very important. I don't want to diminish that. And I'm proud to have been a regular doctor in the United States. But it's only 20%. But in terms of the proportional distribution of the information doctors get, 96% of the research is about new drugs and devices. 96% of the new knowledge that doctors get is about new drugs and devices, whereas 80% of our health is determined by how we live our lives. And that's the mismatch. That's how so many people can be taking so many medicines, and yet Americans' health is falling further and further behind the other countries, the other wealthy countries. So that now 1.1 million Americans die in excess of the death rates in the other wealthy countries each year, 1.1 million excess deaths. That's 3,000 excess deaths a day in the United States. That's like a 9-11 every day in the United States because our health and healthcare are so inferior. And at the core of that is that doctors are being taught to practice the wrong kind of medicine. They're not addressing what the real determinants of health are. 
And it's not just that 3,000 Americans are dying in excess every day, but when you compare what we're paying as a nation for our health care to what other nations pay for their health care, we are spending an excess $2.3 trillion a year. Excess. We spend about twice that much on health care, but $2.3 trillion more than we would be spending if we were spending what the other wealthy countries are. That's as much as the entire federal budget deficit. Dedicated doctors, honorable doctors, disciplined doctors are getting fed the wrong information about what is going to make Americans optimally healthy, most effectively and efficiently. So let's talk about that part, because I think that's huge, where the foundation of information for the doctors is incorrect. This is the part that I think is the most important for anybody to understand. And this is the part that I was really surprised by when I was going into all this and, you know, listening to you on Joe Rogan and a bunch of different podcasts and then reading your books. It's like the foundation of information for doctors is peer reviewed studies. It Correct. seems right. Uh, and you can break this down to me afterwards. Like I'm six. No, no, you got I'm it. You're, need on, that. you're but, on track. You know, the, the foundation of information for doctors to understand what a, what a potential solution might be for their uh, patients would be the peer reviewed studies. And so the assumption by doctors is that their peers have actually reviewed, not just the metadata, but also the individual data that comes from these studies that are done on in like clinical trials and, st and so on and so forth. So the, the doctors are then taking that information and if it's checked off, like it's good to go, you know, it's peer reviewed, it's approved, then they then feel um, comfortable recommending that or prescribing that to their client base as, you know, these are the, these are the results. This is what we are seeing in the data. You're good taking this based off of all the symptoms you have. But what you're saying actually is that that information is at its core controlled by the big pharmaceutical yes, companies? Yes, and the fundamental purpose of that information is to increase the profits of the drug and device companies. And it, it, there's two levels of it, Lauren. One is that the doctors are taught it's gospel. There is nothing that is more drummed into medical students and young doctors' heads than they must practice evidence-based medicine. Yet the definition of evidence-based medicine is what's published in peer-reviewed medical journals and clinical practice guidelines. And the doctors don't understand that when articles are peer-reviewed to assure their accuracy and completeness, that the peer reviewers don't get to see the data from the study. They just get to see the data summary that's in, in the manuscript that's submitted to the medical journal for publication which is usually influenced by the manufacturer. So it's basically the right. manufacturer's version of the story, and that's published in the medical journals, and that's evidence-based medicine. But the highest level of evidence, the most compelling and the most important evidence to follow is in the clinical practice guidelines. And the docs don't understand that the experts who write those clinical practice guidelines often have financial ties to the drug companies. About half of the chairs and vice chairs of the panels that write those guidelines have financial ties to the drug companies. And most importantly, that the experts who write those clinical practice guidelines, they don't get the data either. They just put together the data from the articles that are published that are accepted as evidence-based medicine, but, are, but haven't been checked for, the, for their truthfulness. So it's like a house of cards that's built on non-transparency. And the docs, yeah. when I talk to doctors about this, they say, yeah, we know the drug companies are involved, but we can sort it out. We had some statistics in medical school and some analysis of studies, and we can sort it out. And they don't understand. There's no way they can sort it out because they can't see it. The only way to sort it out is to get the data. And the only way to get the data is in litigation. They're not releasing the data. Right. The drug companies say right out front, they own the data, they own the data, and the purpose of the data is to enhance their marketing. And we're not giving you the data. So so I'm gonna kind of explain this how it should go, right? And then tell yep. me where I'm wrong. Because I really want 
I really want to understand this at its core. The way it should work is the potentially the company who's looking to get the research done on its product, let's say whatever the form, let's say a weight loss um, pill or shot, that company will help to design that study. But then also the study in theory should be, you know, there should be other people that have a non-biased interest also designing that research, that study for people that are going to take that, that, that shot. Let me, let's stop there. Doing. What you said is perfectly rational, and in a better functioning society, that would be exactly what happens. We understand that the drug company is funding this study because they want to come out with positive results and they want to maximize sales of their drugs. We understand that. We're a capitalist society. I don't have any better ideas than capitalism as a way to organize the economy of a society. I'm not critical of that. Right. But we do know that there are excesses to profit-seeking. And there should be independent oversight. And that independent oversight isn't there. So the drug companies right. can design studies of weight loss drugs or cholesterol lowering drugs or diabetes drugs that are designed to produce results that will sell the most drugs. Mm. Okay. So, so the way, yeah, in a perfect world, it should be working like that non-biased parties designing these studies, but it's not working like that. Um, I believe when I was reading your book, it was saying that it used to be more like that. I think it now it's something far less that the involvement with these. Regardless, it used to be like that. No, now, it's Lauren, let me interrupt. More. You've got it. It used to be that the okay. academic medical centers, the um, universities, uh, medical centers, um, did um, 80 percent of the drug company's clinical research in 1991. Academic medical centers were hired by the drug companies to do 80% of their clinical research. That meant the academics within those academic medical centers got to play a role in the designing of the studies and the collection of the data and the analysis of the data and writing it up for publication. So in 1991, 80% of studies were done by academic medical centers. That changed so quickly mm -hmm. in the next 13 years that by 2004, only 26% of the clinical studies funded by pharmaceutical companies were done in academic medical centers, and the rest were done by, by for-profit research companies that the drug companies hired, and those companies had to please the drug companies, the research companies had to please the drug companies, or they wouldn't get contracts, and the academic medical centers had to compete with the standards that the contract research organizations were willing to work for with the drug companies. So uh, one of the deputy editor of the Journal of the American Medical Association said during this decline in the uh, amount of research that was being done in academic medical centers, he said it's a, in, in the academic medical centers, the clinical research is a race to the ethical bottom. And 50% of the contracts between the drug companies and the academic medical centers said that the drug companies, the sponsors of the, of the research, have the right to write up the articles, write up the articles, and the authors of the articles can suggest revisions. Not demand revisions, <laughs> they can suggest revisions. So that means that 50%, half of the, half of the studies that are done in academic medical centers and paid for by drug companies can be ghostwritten. That the, the named authors, the respected academicians who are the named authors on the paper don't have control of what's published in their own papers. The research that's being done, so to back this up, back to where like the, I wanna rehash this from the beginning, the, the research as it's being designed the surveys and the studies and all that are being designed majority by the big pharmaceutical companies. That's kind of their interest is involved with that. Who's going to be a part of it, how old they are, what their issues might be already, what they're predisposed to have. All of that is selected by the pharmaceutical companies, right? Man, and let's keep going. The, Don't get off that subject yet. And the doses of the drugs okay. and the drugs that their new drug will be compared to and the, whether or not lifestyle is included in the study design, all that's in the control of the drug company. Okay, so then all of that is in the control of the, God, the drug company. So then the drug company 
So Lexus Data, they, they are the people, they then create the um, environment to have this study done. And then they are the only, you're telling me that they're the only people that can actually see the individual data before it's actually then packaged into what would be metadata, put in a manuscript, and then given to the peers for peer review. The pharmaceutical company is the only one that can have eyes on that individual Co data. Correct. Right? And now, and they parcel out the data the, the way they want to. The way you put it is that you had access to corporate computers for big pharmaceutical companies for 10 years. Yeah, more <laughs> so than 10 years, actually. You've got more than 10 years. So you have the inside information onto exactly what's going on in these organizations that are producing the pharmaceuticals that majority of the world, but also the United States is consuming. So, you know, then you were called up by other lawyers to be an expert in what these companies were doing. So the amount of information that you have is enormous. I don't think you can even share majority of that on here because you're under an NDA, right? Uh, and let me just add, Lauren, it wasn't just that I had access to it, but that I had, I was part of a team with uh, intense skills, statisticians, epidemiologists, um, research design folks, so that I could look at the overview of the data as a family physician does primary care and looks at the overview of the patient. But then when I saw an issue that looked like it needed statistical expertise or epidemiological expertise, I could call in that expertise whenever I needed it. So I could, it wasn't just that I could analyze the data, but I could work as part of a team, be kind of the quarterback to hand off the different parts um, of vertical expertise that was needed to do a true analysis of the situation. What is your opinion on fat loss pills? like Ozempic. And this, I recognize you're not a medical doctor. I'm not oh, saying that you're wait a minute, I medical am a medical doctor. Right now, but... I just gave up my license now. Well, yeah. you are a medical doctor, but are you practicing <laughs> no, now, I guess? And just gave right. up my license <laughs> two days ago on my birthday. Fair enough. Okay, well, all right. That's even better than you have two days ago. Okay, so what would be your take with all the information that you have for somebody who's trying to lose weight? Because one of the things I talk about here a lot is helping people to achieve their potential, whether that's looking the way they want to look, you know, feeling good, feeling the way they want to feel, ultimately not being buried underneath all of this stuff that dampens their potential and makes them feel sick and, and look bad. So a lot of people try these hacks, you know, Ozempic, and they try to lose all these weight. And it's not just Ozempic, there's others too, but given all the information you have, What's your thoughts there? We obviously live in a fat genic society. 42% of Americans are obese now. Adult Americans are obese. Um, that's about twice as many as were obese in the early 80s. Did you say 42% are obese. obese? Yes. Obese? obese? Oh yeah. my gosh. O overweight in is the United much States? higher. Yes, in the United States. And oh it's gosh. on the way up. It's going to be 50% in 10 years or so. Jeez. Um, our genes haven't changed in the last 40 years. So something about the way we live is generating that obesity. And it's not rocket science. It's processed food. It's the corn industry that got subsidies that, and the corn syrup ends up in the soda and in the, in the processed foods. Mm -hmm. That when um, we do studies about helping people lose weight, because the studies are funded by the drug companies, they'll do drug or no drug. There was a really important foundational study that was done in, uh, it was published in 2002 in the New England Journal of Medicine um, called the Diabetes Prevention Program. The study was funded by the National Institutes of Health. Um, drug companies provided some of the medications, but they didn't have control over the design of the study. And this study, was designed the right way. They had a placebo group that got a little bit of counseling about weight loss. The, the population was people who were pre-diabetic. And the, uh, the uh, main outcome measure was the percentage of people who went on to develop diabetes. And there were three arms, not two. It wasn't just drug and no drug. It was a placebo group with no drug, a drug group that took metformin, and an intensive lifestyle counseling group. And the people who were in the intensive lifestyle counseling group, 
they didn't volunteer to be in that group. They were randomized to that group. So that many times when you do an observational study and you get people who exercise, who have a healthy lifestyle anyway, they have less heart disease and they're healthier. <clears throat> but this was a randomized controlled trial, control group, drug group, and lifestyle group. And what this study showed is four years later, after setting up this study, the people who were in the lifestyle group had a 58% lower risk of developing diabetes than the control group. And the people who were in the drug group had a 31% lower risk of developing diabetes than the people in the control group. So what this study, so I'm double. sorry? So almost double. double. Yeah. But what this study showed definitively is that you can get people to change their way of life. You can get people to adopt healthy lifestyle. And it's twice, almost twice as effective as drug therapy in preventing diabetes. That was published in 2002. Our society is conditioned to believe that a pill is going to solve problems or a shot is going to solve these problems that they're not solvable. When in reality, in my eyes, I actually believe that so much of the food that we eat and the sunshine and being around nature and having community and all of those other things is what actually helps people feel better. And that's not just not being obese. That's not being on antidepressants or anti-anxiety, you know, being able to get pregnant, all these things that come up because our body is so stressed out or we're living in such unnatural environments to what we're used to. You know, and I, I guess what I would ask you too is as a practicing doctor, knowing what you know, and well, I guess you're not a practicing doctor anymore, but knowing what you know um, and just not practicing as of two days ago, if somebody were to come to you and ask you if they should get on one of those fat loss medications because they need to lose weight, would you feel worried for their safety on that, knowing what you know about big pharmaceutical? And I'm not isolating one. I'm just saying overall. I would be worried. It reminds me of the FenFen disaster where people who were overweight were taking a combination of uh, two, two diet drugs and they were losing a lot of weight quickly. And it uh, ended up creating an enormous amount of heart disease, valvular heart disease. Mm -hmm. And Mother Nature didn't intend for us to maintain a normal weight by taking these drugs that affect the gut and the gut-brain relationship. So um, maybe I'm being a little bit of a Christian scientist here, but I think that the natural way to go is going to be more effective and safer in the long run than these weight loss drugs. And Actually, I think uh, that was going to be something I wanted to bring up too in what you found. I wonder if, this, if these pills are designed to be needed for the rest of your life because that's where the profit comes in. It's like a subscription fee, yeah. you know, that you just Yeah, well, it's paying. a perfect situation for the drug companies that you need to keep taking them or you lose your um, you lose your weight loss and your self-image starts to turn negative yeah. and so forth. And something I just saw the uh, last couple of days, in the United States, the price for these weight loss drugs is four to eight times higher than in the other wealthy countries. So that there's, yeah. What? Yeah. Because they can, correct me if I'm wrong, but advertise, or, uh, pharmaceutical companies, they pick the price that they want to sell the product for, right? They just arbitrarily Correct. select in the United States, not in the other countries. We're the only country that lets the drug companies set their own prices. So they have a monopoly on their drugs that are patented. Ozempic has a patent um, and the, the manufacturer has a monopoly on that. So they can then spend a fortune in drug advertising to convince people that this is the solution to their weight problem. And um, mm. And the fact that they're charging four to eight times more than in other countries gives them an enormous kitty to spend marketing the drug and with all the TV ads that we see. And the advertising, that's a big part of this. I talk about this a lot. So I used to work in advertising. I'm the director of sales where I work at a, a large company. Thank God we sell a really great mm. product. So that's awesome. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, but I'm all about sales. You know, that's what I understand and advertising is huge. And what I often talk about with this carnivore lifestyle or this animal-based lifestyle um, is just more, 
it's it's about really understanding that we need to eat real food and majority of what humans at least in the states are conditioned to eat is stuff that's processed yes. and it's because that's constantly what we're advertised all the time and it's we think it's normal Correct. like having a bag of chips is Correct is normal, that's the right? purpose it's of the really advertising not. is to make it appear right. normal to eat a bag totally. of fat and salt Yeah and it's absolutely turning us around because then we think it's normal to go get a pill from your doctor to then fix your problems. Like all of that is super abnormal, but talking about it sounds super wooey, you know, <laughs> air quotes. Um, and it's, it sounds like a, some hippy dippy person. So it's, it's like, no, not at all. We're spending thousands of dollars on stuff that's making us sick. And then thousands of dollars on stuff that's supposed to be correcting the sickness because, because of the advertising that goes into this pharmaceutical um, system. So talk to me about the advertising. I know it's different in the States and other countries. Right. What is and that there's like? another dimension to this, Lauren, it's, that's important. New Zealand is the only other developed country that allows direct to consumer advertising. Now, New Zealand has a very effective national pharmaceutical program where they independently analyze the cost and the benefit of drugs and make recommendations nationally for coverage and pricing about drugs. In the United States, there's no equivalent program for drugs. We don't um, <clears throat> have any agency that measures the cost effectiveness of drugs that compares, for example, the efficacy of Ozempic in uh, weight loss to intensive lifestyle counseling, which would cost far less money. So, so we've got a natural okay. experiment here. New Zealand is advertising drugs, allows a drug advertising. The United States allows drug advertising. New Zealand has a rational drug policy. The United States has a Wild West drug policy. And the results are yeah. that we spend by far the most per person on pharmaceuticals each year among wealthy countries. And New Zealand spends the least amount. So it's not the advertising per se, it's the context in which the advertising takes place with no other uh, programs to inform doctors and payers about rational use of pharmaceuticals. So we've got this deadly combination of no price controls, no health technology assessment to inform doctors about which drugs are effective and which ones aren't. And then, um, we uh, allow the drug companies to charge whatever they want. So we, we, it's like giving them a, a credit card for unlimited advertising budget because they're going to make it back when, when the ads go on TV. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we're the only country outside of New Zealand, right, that does allow advertising for pharmaceuticals. Right. And we're the only country that doesn't okay. have a comprehensive uh, control program to control the use of pharmaceuticals. That's the, that's the combination okay. that's so bad. Right. Yeah. And it's, I mean, advertising is people, we like, we like to think that we can protect ourselves from it and that it's, you know, if we're aware of it, it's not that big of a deal, yada, yada, but it's not that simple. If you're seeing something constantly all the flipping time, you know, and it's presented to you in such a way that, you know, you're running in the forest or in the fields and it's and like, there's, there's <laughs> babies and, and dogs catching family. frisbees and yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, they love yeah. each other and everybody's yeah. happy. And, you know, you look great. They, yeah. It's a picnic. Yeah. Like <laughs> this, this whole, right. if you see that every other commercial, let's be honest, if you watch TV anymore, which I can't even hardly watch TV at all because of the ads, but anywhere you look so many ads. And I think, what is it like most of the news channels are funded. Some of their biggest funders are big farmers. Yes, and right? I think you'll notice that when um, when the news channels have a, a pharmaceutical ad, a drug ad on either side of a segment, there are no pharma critics on that on that segment that's bounded by a drug ad, and it happens to be that all segments are bounded by a drug ad. You, you don't when oh. I, when my first big book came out in two thousand and four. I was on TV all the time. I got, I did maybe 80 national television interviews. I did one after this book was published, after Sickening was published. Interesting. Yeah, because they didn't, well, so how does that work? When you were on, they were, ha when you were on uh, news channels, were they talking to you about, what were they They would ask about? me, um, uh, say uh, a particularly dramatic example was, I was recognized as having expertise in Vioxx 
and the news broke about Vioxx causing uh, doubling the risk of heart attacks and strokes. Celebrex, which is a mm-hmm. cousin of Vioxx, had a study that came out that showed that Celebrex increased the risk of cardiovascular disease. So they would call me uh, as soon as the news broke and I would get up to snuff in an hour, two hours, three hours, and they'd send out a limousine to bring me to a TV station or a satellite uh, studio. And I'd tell them what I knew about the drug. That doesn't happen anymore. You don't see anybody on TV presenting the critical view of drugs. The critical view just isn't there. It's been taken off the air. Okay, so so you're saying that at that time when you were talking about this, maybe there were fewer drug companies as sponsors. And they had um, captured, there were fewer drug ads. Uh, there were some drug ads, but there were fewer ads. drug ads. But the drug ads hadn't captured the editorial content of the news programs. I see. Okay, so now it's like, to your point, they'll never invite you on again because the entire system (laughs) is controlled by the pharmaceutical companies who are dictating the narrative around the pharmaceutical. And they're not going to have John Abramson come on and talk about how it's potentially causing its faulty data and causing multiple hundreds of thousands. My phone's not ringing Uh, off the hook right now. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. I can see that. I can see why. Um, okay, so, <laughs> and you used to travel, uh, you did all different news yes. news places, <laughs> like ABC News, Nine News, yeah, Today Show, yeah, did you yeah. do those? I did the Today Show twice, okay. and, yeah, and Fox okay. News was good to me, all the, all the stations called me. Wow, that's fascinating, and now you don't get any calls oh. from them. Do you have an opinion about the carnivore or the animal-based lifestyle, if you know much about it? I don't know much about it. I've tuned out. I think I've heard you do other podcasts and uh, focus in on processed foods being the problem. And I agree completely with that. I think if there is a difference between a carnivore-based diet and a plant-based diet, it's probably much smaller than getting enough exercise and not eating processed foods and not smoking um, and not drinking in excess and maintaining a a proper body weight. I think those things are far more important than the differences between the real foods that we eat, be they uh, animal-based or plant-based. To your point, I think that the processed foods, the removal of those is one of the biggest factors. Um, I would encourage you to look into it only because um, it's really not about a diet. It's it's really not. It's, it's more so that it's unfolding what's going on with cholesterol, how that's been demonized um, and then how the how the food industry is captured by pharmaceuticals but also processed food I mean farmers if we most farmers out there they farm corn and other things for processed food and that's set that makes up 75 percent of the U.S. diet mm-hmm. today is processed mm-hmm. foods, ultra processed foods, not just processed foods, which is crazy. So one of the benefits for people when they try this animal-based or carnivore lifestyle is that they're finally satiated. They feel full. And so they eat a lot less and they don't have cravings anymore mm-hmm. for food, but all of their physical ailments go away. Anxiety, depression, it's crazy. It's like ridiculous. So I'm, I'm like you, I think if you can do a plant-based lifestyle and that's great, like good for you. Um, <clears throat> all of that is good as long as you're going in the right direction. But yeah, it's it's a fascinating world to look into because of how it's similar to you. It's unveiling a lot of what is actually the truth, not just what we've been taught in the medical system. Right. I think that's exactly yeah. right, Lauren. I mean, the, the, the same way that the function of the drug companies is to maximize the financial returns to investors and the function of the mm-hmm. food companies is the same thing. They're trying to maximize their investment. So they know, just like the drug companies know how to design studies that are likely to come out in their favor and maintain control of the data and so forth. Mm -hmm. The food companies know how to design foods that are appealing to the palate. Whether they're good Mm -hmm. for you or not is not the issue. It's how much money they get from you to buy those foods. And we get the same- Yeah, the better it tastes. Yeah, we get the same problem that- (laughs) to maximize the food company's profits, they go to the salt and um, fat-based um, uh, processed foods. Mm-hmm. And in the drug companies, they go to the drugs that provide expensive solutions to many problems that are um, environmental. Now, 
we've all benefited from good drugs. I am not saying there are not good drugs out there and I'm not saying there's not good medical care out there, but I am saying that the core purpose of both the food industry and the drug industry is to maximize their profits, not to maximize the health and well-being of the consumers. Briefly, can you touch on Vioxx and what happened with Vioxx or maybe statins in your experience with statins, specifically Trulicity as an example? Maybe we talk about Trulicity um, because it's a statin. It's more related no, to statins. No, tru Trulicity is not a statin. It's a diabetes drug. No, I know that, but I didn't mean to say statins. I meant to say insulin. Sorry. Um, it's more related yeah. to insulin. Why don't we talk about Trulicity and how that's related to insulin? Because I think a lot of people are using Trulicity. There's actually a national shortage right now, apparently, until the end of this year, into next year. That's how many people are using it. What have you found with well, Trulicity? Well, Trulicity is a drug that lowers blood sugar. Um, it's expensive. It studies, or a study, I'm not sure how many studies have shown that it decreases the risk of cardiovascular disease in people with diabetes. <clears throat> but it does that. Uh, you have to treat many people with Trulicity in order to prevent one episode, one cardiovascular episode. And what happens is the same thing that we've been talking about, Lauren. If you have to treat, I forget the number, 200, 300, 100 people for a number of years with Trulicity to prevent one cardiovascular event. If we were telling the public through uh, uh, public service advertising and telling the doctors that you're going to prevent a lot more cardiovascular disease in diabetic patients, if you can get those folks to exercise routinely, not to smoke and to eat a healthy diet. So the Trulicity is a money-making way to accomplish that. Um, changes in lifestyle would be a far more effective and less expensive way to do that. But the, in, the insulin story is a really important story. I don't know if we have time to really get into it. Sure. Uh, but as you, as you probably know, there's been a move uh, to limit the copay and it got up to $300 a vial very quickly. There's only three companies, three companies dominate the insulin market and they could act as a cartel and they took those prices way up high. So now we've got this in, uh, Inflation Reduction Act that limits the insulin copay to $35. The key to this story is that there's no evidence that the first generation of genetically engineered insulin was better than animal insulin and there's no evidence that the second generation of genetically engineered insulin analogs is better than the first generation. So we've got these enormously high charges that the drug companies have made fortunes on. And there's no evidence at all for type two diabetics who consume 80% of the insulin in the United States that the insulin analogs are better than the recombinant human insulin. So ultimately, the information about insulin that majority of people are buying, buying into to buy the product is not accurate. Correct. They're spending thousands Correct. of dollars and on potentially not useful Correct. solutions. Correct. And this blew my mind. This is a chapter in my book, Sickening. And I didn't know about yeah. this until I started writing the book. But um, people are and doctors are being convinced and how they got convinced that the insulin analogs were better than the first generation of a recombinant insulin, genetically engineered insulin, was that there was a marketing program that was run by a public relations company that was funded by the insulin manufacturers. And this public relations company created standards of diabetic care that were adopted by the American Diabetes Association and the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists uh, that advocated the use of the analog insulin and, and really tight control when there was no evidence that it was superior for uh, people with type 2 diabetes. They've covered up that issue. We can't get that issue out. And I would encourage people to read chapter four of Sickening to see what a sham this is and how many people have been hurt because they think and their doctors think that they have to take the expensive insulin when the far less expensive insulin would be just as good. How many people in the United States have died from faulty data given about pharmaceutical companies? I think the best number for that is the number of deaths that occur in the United States in excess of the death rates in the other developed countries. 
and that's 3,000 people a day. What do people do for, what do people do now? You know, if they're like on medication and they have these issues, I know the obvious answer is to go and improve your lifestyle, you know, but does that mean go to your doctor and say, I'm not taking No, it doesn't. Anymore, right? It doesn't. I've benefited. I have, uh, medical care has saved my life, and uh, I wouldn't advise anybody to swear off medical care. Uh, what it means is that you need to be the partner with your health care provider, be it a doctor, nurse practitioner, physician assistant. You need to try to help make your health care provider a better provider and ask, are there alternatives to these medicines? Can I cut down the doses if I exercise more, if I can lose some weight, if I can make other changes in my lifestyle? Can I decrease these doses and try to get off some of these medicines? In, I spoke in Canada a couple of years ago, a few years ago, and um, deprescribing is a big issue for Canadian doctors, that the Canadian primary care physicians see a large part of their job as taking people off medicines in a controlled, careful mm -hmm. way. That's not in the American doctor's consciousness about deprescribing. No. Um, and we need to make that a normal, a, a normal topic of conversation in our doctor visits. So that my advice is to work with your healthcare providers, get educated yourselves. This is why I wrote Sickening, to help people understand the questions that they need to ask of their healthcare providers, and then see if you can form a partnership with your healthcare providers so that the two of you together can provide better, more natural, less pharmacological care. Where can people find you and your material? Um, the material's in the book. Google me. Uh, I'm not a good social media guy. Uh, I put my effort into figuring these things out and talking to people like you. Mm -hmm. um, but Google me and you'll see uh, The Rogan Show, uh, Lex Fridman. Uh, there's a ton of uh, broadcasts um, uh, and lectures I've given. And please go search and look. It's so important. Absolutely. Okay. And I'll attach all of your links below. Um, Overdosed and Sickening, really amazing books. I so appreciate your work as well as some of the uh, other podcasts that you've done, like the Joe one that you mentioned, that one was incredible. So John, I really appreciate your time today and your work that you're doing. Well, Lauren, you. I wanna thank you. If it weren't for people like you, my work would be, um, I would be in a, in a soundproof vault uh, doing this work. So mm -hmm. it, I, I'm the geek, but you gotta get this stuff out.